certified. So the benefits of being a CPA, you know, all the uh, salary uh, recognition and all the stuff. CPAs make much, much more money. All companies. Now, you know, United States, the world economy, 30% of the world economy is uh, on account of U.S. companies spread all over the world. Even when you go to India, you look at the stock markets, a lot of Indian companies, KPMG, all the companies listed on this screen, World Bank, Petney Computers, Pricewaterhouse, uh, Citigroup, uh, you know, Infosys, Standard, Accenture, Wipro, uh, KPMG, all these companies are American companies located in India. You know, we do training for World Bank. We do training for KPMG, Ernest and uh, Young, uh, JP Morgan, Barclays, American Express. So why do people, <clears throat> I, and uh, we do training for Deloitte also. And, you know, I've been very uh, active in conducting all the employees, uh, conducting training sessions for employees of Deloitte who joined Deloitte uh, in U.S. taxation, U.S. GAAP, basic accounting, GAAP principles and all this stuff. So wherever you have presence of American companies, there's a potential of, uh, you know, employment as a CPA back in that country. And India has a lot of potential. India is also the hub of the back office to do accounting and uh, U.S. taxation work. You will be, I'm not going to name the company, but just to tell you, one of the big top accounting firms, 40% of their global tax returns are being done from India. So how do you how do you enroll for the CP examination? You need to qualify on three fronts. Now, you know, unlike the Indian Chartered Accountancy Program, which starts after 12, the CPA course starts after graduation. So first, you have to be eligible. Eligible means how many years of education, how many semester credits do you have, and then you have to write the examination. So Indian graduates having an associate degree from an accredited university with relevant experience will qualify for the examination. So who will qualify if you're a chartered accountant, if you're an ICWA, you're a company secretary, you're an MBA, uh, you're a postgraduate, you're commerce graduates, all of you will qualify. Now qualification means that you become eligible to write the examination. So that is the uh, education requirement to write the examination. So once you, uh, so Orbit will help you determine from which state you qualify. What we will ask you to do is to send us all your transcripts from high school, you know, grade 10, grade 12, BCom 1, BCom 2, BCom 3, what university you went to. And if you've got MCom 1, MCom 2 or MBA 1, we will look at all your credentials and we'll tell you you are eligible to write the examination from that state. Now, not every state will allow foreign students to write the examination and uh, for, for reasons which could be regulated by the state, some states will say that, okay, you need to have a social security number in the U.S. before you can qualify for the examination. So that determination of where you should write the examination, we will help you with that. We will tell you exactly where to go. And once you write it, as I mentioned to you, you can transfer your grades to any state. Say my, my uncle lives in California and I write my examination from Delaware. After I pass, I can transfer my grades to uh, California. So education requirements. Uh, most, most states will require 150 semester hours. Some states will allow you to write for less than that, but most of them will require 150 semester hours. Uh, Sometimes, you know, with 120 semester hours, you can uh, write the examination. My son uh, is uh, writing his examination. You know, he, he's got all his credits. So he has about 142 credit hours. So he's still short of eight, eight credit hours, but he's already he's written his examination. He's passed three papers. He's writing one paper in about two weeks. So... How does he go up from 142 credit hours to 150? Okay, so with 120 credit hours, which you, most of you will get with your BCom qualification, you'll be able to write the examination. Now, the only thing between 120 and 150 hours is that you, and you'll have to get additional 20 to 30 credit hours, which you can get by taking any online courses. 
with any educational institute or any university in India. And we will help you also co coordinate that. Some people, you know, join the CPA course with us and simultaneously join MCOM part one, an online course to the university if they don't qualify for this credit hours. Okay, to, to have a license, you will need 150 semester hours. Now the CPA examination has four papers. So most of the, most of your knowledge and your background is completed up to the graduation level. So when they look at your semester hours, they're looking at some experience in accounting, some in statistics, some in costing, some in business, some in law, and maybe some in taxation. But as I mentioned, it, you know, it can vary from state to state. So once you get the 120 semester hours or more, you are eligible to write the examination. So there are four papers, financial accounting and uh, reporting, auditing and attestation, regulation, and uh, business environment. All of these are four hour papers. Okay, 60%, 50% of the examination is multiple choice. And 50% is task-based simulation, which is like essay type questions, you know, which tests you on your comprehension, on your analytical abilities and all the stuff. The financial accounting and uh, accounting and reporting paper is very similar to what you do here. Of course, you know, we have U.S. generally accepted accounting principles, which, you know, which are very similar to IFRS. There are some variations. Indian principles are almost, uh, you know, as uh, just as uh, good as the IFRS principles. So the only thing that is different in this paper is governmental accounting and a bit of uh, U.S. CAP principles. So, and non-profit accounting. So when you approach this paper, you've already done about 70 to 80 percent of this paper. As I mentioned, you have multiple choice questions and that task based simulations, the passing grade is 75 percent marks. There's no negative marking. Then the second paper is auditing. You've already done this paper. Uh, the, the auditing standard, the, you know, the content of the audit report is very different. But the principles are the same, you know, audit, internal controls, communications, reporting, uh, all the all that stuff is very similar. Okay, same thing, 75% marks, four hours paper, 50% multiple choice, 50% uh, task-based simulation. Regulation is one paper, which is U.S. taxation and other U.S. laws, other statutes, you know, like uh, ethics, business law, uh, law of securities, law of transactions. So this is a totally new paper for you. And again, four hours, 75%, 50-50. And business environment is another paper that you are familiar with, corporate governance, economics, financial management, information systems, planning, operations, uh, all that stuff. So uh, four hours, 75% marks and all this stuff. Now, this, uh, the CP examination now there are a lot of changes now in when you can write the CP examination. <clears throat> the CP examination, you know, because of the virus, things are very very different now. So the CP examination is a computer based examination which can be written on demand, and the CP examination can be written any time, any time uh, as often as you want to now. Previously, you know, there were windows like you know. Uh, uh, a two months window, January and February and March, up to March 10th was one window. So if you wrote one paper in that window, you could not repeat that paper in that window. But so, but starting from January 1st, 2020, starting from, in fact, sorry, June 1st, 2020, uh, the CP examination can be written as frequently as you want to. I'll give you one example now. Say, uh, my son, I'll give you my son's example. So he's writing his examination on uh, July 20th. His results will be out on August 5th after about 10, 10 12 days. Now, previously, you know, he could not write some I mean, under the previous me mechanism. If he enrolled in July, he could not write in July, August, September. He would have to wait from July to write the next attempt in October. Now, he writes in July 20th, August 5th, his result is out. If he chooses, and if he doesn't uh, clear, 
he can write the examination even on August 10th again. So every time your result is out, you can again, if you if you don't pass, you can again enroll the examination, uh, enroll for the examination and write the examination. So there is no uh, windows anymore now. And the CP examination is in India now. In September and December, it's, it's being written in India and also from January to June of 2021, the examination will be offered in India with the 90% probability that it will be continued to be offer, uh, offered in India. So the Becker CPA review, as I mentioned to you, I mentioned to you that all the toppers are all Becker students. 75% of all CPA students are uh, all CPAs in the world are Becker students. So when you when you're deciding to study with one particular, I mean, even you know, we don't have an analysis uh, for India, but I can tell you right now that the our pass rate with the Becker material with Orbit Institutes is almost about seventy percent. Seventy percent of our students clear the examination in the first attempt. We give you everything. You know, when we wrote the examination, we could, we did not have lectures at all. Now. You get textbooks, the same uh, a hard copy and a soft copy. You get 6,500 online multiple choice questions. You get 250 task based simulations. You get three mock tests and you also get online lectures. The online lectures, I'm, I'm just going to take you through a demo of an online lecture also and how we help it. So all these things are given to you and so you have uh, you have everything you require to pass, and these are uh, these content. You know the examination and the review content is prepared by a team of 150 professionals of US and is updated regularly. So we have the highest pass rate, the greatest success. We got a very good track record, and this is probably the best choice. As you know, almost seven out of every ten people, all the top. 1000 accounting firms all the top colleges in the united states take the becker cpa review course okay so that was all about uh, cpa i'm going to now uh, so you know we as orbit institutes we will uh, as i mentioned we've got 120 teachers you will be joining now because this is why does there are online classes. You'll be joining online classes. I'll personally conduct classes from here, from United States. We will give you, you'll have all the material that you need uh, to prepare. And then there'll be local, there are 120 teachers that we have in India and, and some in the US also who will be conducting online lectures which can join regularly. In addition to that, we will help you with uh, all the eligibilities, all the selection of where you should go for uh, write the examination. If you need help when you come to write the examination in the U.S. or if you don't come to the U.S. and you want to write in India, you can write in India. We will help you with uh, job placements in India because, you know, we have connections with so many corporates in India. And we'll also help you with job placements in the U.S. And if required, we also give you one week of free practical on hand training in US taxation. We will help you prepare a tax return of a taxpayer in the US, a tax return of an of a of a C Corp or a private limited company. So whatever you learn in theoretics will help you uh, you know put that into uh, action also. So if you have any questions, you know, before I go into the lecture, if you have any questions uh, about anything you want to ask me, the, maybe you can ask me. Anybody? Hello. Questions you have? Yes. Uh, hello, Krish. Can you hear me? Hey, yeah. Hey, this is Arma from Calcutta. 
yeah uh, uh, i'm uh, planning as like uh, we are here i'm planning to pursue this uh, uscp course so i have one question like suppose if we if we got selected from any of the states to appear in the exams and we got and we clear the exam so regarding this license part is there any period uh, within which we need to apply for the license and and is there any uh, requirement that every year we need to do some you know sort of uh, uh, like uh, what uh, webinars or something to get the uh, license continue every year like suppose in india we need to have some cprs in order to uh, you know carry forward our cop certificate of practice so is there any requirement in us regarding the same okay let me let me answer that question as i mentioned you know i'm licensed in ohio i'm licensed in new jersey i'm licensed in florida now uh, so after you pa- so what are the what are the conditions for getting a license so the first condition is that you should pass all your examinations uh, and the minimum score in all these four papers you should score 75% marks immediately when you pass you you will be uh, required to write an ethics examination which is an online uh, study at home exam conducted by the aicpa so after you pass these four papers you write the ethics exam and you clear that examination you can it's it's an open book examination it's 100 questions you know what are the ethical responsibilities of a practicing cpa so you study that and you write that examination and you score in that paper you have to score 90% marks and you can you know attempt it as many times as you want to uh, but the minute you clear that you are fully eligible to apply for a license in any any particular state so to get your license in any particular state they require, they, they want you to have cleared the examination cleared the ethics examination and also have 2 years of practical training experience now uh, this experience that you you are required to have can be before you uh, write the examination after the examination let's like say if you have been working with prize war uh, with kpmg in india that experience okay. with kpmg will count towards your licensing we will fully support you with your applications and getting a license we will also will also uh, will support you fully with getting a license and will also you know sort of uh, uh, you know all your experience has to be certified by a practicing cpa now we we do certify your experience not because you work directly under us we say that okay we are familiar with you we have analyzed your job credentials we have analyzed your job experience we get letters from your employers and we we give our supporting letter saying that yes we have verified that you know this person has a relevant experience and then we we help you fill out the licensing application and we we submit it to the state where you want to apply to okay. so once once you get your license your license i mean you have an active license and getting a license as i mentioned as i mentioned to you allows you to conduct public audits in that state Okay. Okay. 70% of uh, CPAs do not have a license because they don't do audit. Let me, let me give you my 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 uh, cross section of what I do. Mm-hmm. You know, audit is audit is one business, but as I mentioned to you, I've got two CPA firms. Mm-hmm. 60, 40, 50 to 60% of my work is for keeping accounting and preparation of tax returns. Okay. Okay. So tax returns of individuals, tax return of C corporations, of S corporations, partnerships. Twenty uh, to thirty percent of my work, I, I would say thirty-five percent of my work is attestation work, leading to a report, which is a review report, or a compilation report. Only two percent of my work is dealing with public audits. Okay. and only for that 2% i need i need to have a license okay, okay. now as i mentioned to you 70% of people uh, cpas do not have a license because they don't want to do audit they do everything else so you're not i mean you you can't do public audits but okay there are if you, if you're trying to work with government organizations government organizations require you to do an audit 
so you have to be licensed if you work with non profit organizations you are required to have a license but if you work with private industry only if a company wants a audit report like when when a company comes to you they say that okay we don't want an audit report we want a review report or we want a compilation Mm-hmm. so then you don't need to be licensed you can do it with your cpa certification also but so okay. so getting your experience you apply for a license you get your license now your license is given is granted to you for 2 years or 3 years it varies from state to state and okay. during those two year every 3 years they require you to do cpe 120 hours of continuing practice education which is what exactly what you mentioned you attend you attend webinars or you do seminars and things like that now if you yes. take training if you take training with us on us tax say on us taxation you come and spend a week uh, with us on free training we will certify that you have taken that training with us and that will count towards your credits also okay okay so okay. all that that is uh, that is all there so sir one last question so yeah. in case if i clear my uscp exam and i don't want the license part so because as you said like only 2% uh, chances are there if i need to go in the public audits then this licensing is license is required so if yeah. i just if i go without license so then after clearing my uscp exams i don't have any further requirement or some uh, what any process or something you know i need to carry out But once clear the uscp exam i can use this uh, degree as a you can say uh, with my profile you can yeah okay. uh, let me okay. let me let me give you couple of examples uh, i had you know when i when i uh, as i mentioned as we started the cpa operations we brought the cpa to india we were the first ones to bring the cpa course on behalf of backer to india back in 1997 oh, okay so we we uh, i was a ca in canada and i was practicing in canada i did my cpa i clear i cleared my cpa examination in 1996 in 1997 i was selected by devry which is the public company now the name's changed uh, at to open up cpa training centers in india so i came to india in 1997 and i opened up centers in 12 cities i'm going to give you few examples there was a lady by the name of jayashree sunkara she was she was a student with us in uh, mumbai and she was also an instructor she got uh, she got interviewed on the telephone back in 1999 and got selected by a telephone interview by kpmg in boston and in back in 1997 she got a starting salary of 90000 Okay. okay another student kazad kotwell a fresh mm-hmm. ca from india from bombay joined our classes mm-hmm. and he cleared his cpa examination in the first attempt today he is uh, a very very senior partner with the with one of the top firms in uh, top accounting firms you know uh, like kpmg prize waterhouse deloitte he is with one of those firms and his package his package is 60 to 80 lakhs right now so when he joined us he was earning 1.5 lakhs so uh, another student of mine devinder sharma who was a student got interviewed by uh, came 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 and worked with me in us and uh, then he uh, got a job as a cpa he set up his own practice in seattle and vancouver okay. there was a student of mine uh, i'm just i'm just giving you a few examples how we can help you there was a student of mine her name was komal she was she was from pune because we were very very closely we we still closely work with deloitte so she said that she wants to move to us so we sent her resume to deloitte in new york she got selected by deloitte in denver colorado and today she is working here so i i can give you so many names of people of our cpa students who are working in canada who are working in united states who are working in dubai who are working in singapore who are working in malaysia all this and in africa 
So we will help you with all this. The one thing I forgot to mention was that very recently, about well, three, four months ago, we we tied up with uh, a top, just like you know, we tied up with Becker for the US CPA. We tied up with the top uh, review course provider for the Canadian CPA course now. Okay. Okay. In January of this year, in January of 2020, <clears throat> There was a reciprocal uh, arrangement signed between the uh, Institute of Chartered Accountants of India and the Institute of uh, CPAs of Canada for reciprocal exchange of uh, qualifications. So an Indian CA is eligible, is eligible to write the Canadian CPA examination, a very condensed exam, only of 12 hours. And just by writing that, he can get his Canadian CPA. And also, also, I want to mention that to you also, that once you write your American CP examination, <clears throat> you will be eligible for a reciprocal exchange with a Canadian qualification also. So we have so many of our students who have done CPA with us from India, and now uh, they have uh, written this reciprocal examination in Canada and are working in Canada. They've got Canadian CA, uh, CA also. Okay. Okay, so we will we'll help you with we'll help you with everything. You know, we got like twenty uh, three years of experience and all this stuff. Okay, Thank you so, a, much. Uh, okay. so I'm going to take you uh, through. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, the CP examination has four papers. You know, financial accounting and reporting, uh, auditing, business environments, and regulation, which is taxation. So the way we conduct our classes is, I mean, you know, you can join. Uh, you, you're from Calcutta, right? You asked me from Calcutta, right? From Calcutta. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we have a we have a center in Calcutta. We have a center in Chandigarh. We have a center in Delhi, in Jaipur, in Hyderabad, uh, Bangalore, uh, Chennai, Cochin, Pune, Mumbai. But you know, right now because of this virtual concept, you can be anywhere and join classes anywhere. So what we're doing is, we are making sure that we have the top-notch instructors. Uh, it could be teaching you from Delhi. I could be teaching you from here, and you can okay. all join the online classes. So the way the way the methodology and as I mentioned, Becker is the top. Uh, you know, doing a CPA and joining Becker CPA review are really synonymous things. It's just like you know, you want to go for the best thing, go with Becker CPA review. Okay. Okay. Now the Becker will give you hard copies and soft copies of the material. They'll give you online lectures and they will also give you uh, 6,500 practice questions. They'll give you 250 uh, simulation questions with the asset type questions and then they'll give you three mock examinations. And then you have 120 CPA teachers who will help you uh, understand the backer material. We as teachers, even I, though I, though I have my own CPA firm here and... Uh, and I'm a CPA, I teach CPA also. But if you ask me whether I can constantly update the CPA material based on all the changing regulations, the amalgamation with IFRS, I would say that I would not be able to do a full justice to that uh, task. So here with Becker, we have, a, we have 150 uh, professionals who do nothing but write the CPA content and update the material every regularly. Our, up, our material is updated and you'll get alert that the material is updated. You can just go and access the material. So uh, today I'm going to take you through financial accounting lecture one. Okay, these lectures are four hour lectures. And, uh, you know, we're not going to do four hours today because today is just a demo class. This uh, this particular lecture is really for you to understand uh, how we teach what is the material that you get? How the local instructors will help you? Now, every one of you will have this book with you, will have the online lectures with you. So before you come to the class, you are required to read that particular lecture. And if I'm teaching you that lecture, I'm not going to, you. and you can listen to the online lectures given by Becker. Okay. What I will do is I will help you understand those online lectures. I will help you explain the differences between US generally accepted accounting principles, 
uh, versus Indian Gap. I will I will try to make sure that your understanding and your ability to comprehend this entire lecture is thoroughly analyzed and understood by you. Because you already have the lectures with you, already have the course content with you, you got the online books, you got the textbooks. So which you will study on and on. So you will come and attend these lectures. After the lectures, you are required. So we have two lectures on a week. On a, The classes are on the weekend. So we have two lectures and after each lecture, you are you before you come for the next week's class, you are required to go home, read the lecture again, do all the multiple choice questions on that lecture, do all the task based simulations and score over 80 to 90 percent in your homework. And then you go to the next lecture. So that is how how the whole concept is uh, working. So I'm going to show you, uh, you know, the uh, the Becker book, how we teach, <coughs> and uh, I'll, so I'll cover a few uh, a few you know pages of standards and conceptual framework. Then I'll go to income statement, and I'll go to income statement uh, on page thirteen, and then I'll go to income statement continued on page forty five. So we'll go to the first one here. OK, every country has its own accounting policies and principles. Now, what do accounting policies and principles tell us? They tell us how to report financial information and how to disclose financial information. Now, reporting and disclosures are two different things. When we say reporting of financial information, we are talking of reporting the financial information in the body of financial statements. So when we talk of financial statements, we're talking of the balance sheet, we're talking of the income statement, we're talking of the statement of cash flows. And when we are disclosing it, we're talking of footnote disclosures. So, so accounting policies and principles tell us how to disclose financial information and how to report financial information. I'll give you one example of this uh, disclosure, the difference between disclosing and reporting. Now, when I look at my balance sheet as per US CAP, as per US generally accepted accounting principles, as a current asset on my balance sheet, I have inventories. Now, you know that the breakdown of inventory can be in the form of a work, it can be raw material. You can have raw material inventory, you can have work in progress inventory or you can have finished goods inventory. But the balance sheet does not reflect that. The balance sheet only reflects the total quantity of the inventory. Okay, inventory as a current asset, $10,000. Where would I find the, break up, the breakdown of that inventory? The breakdown of that inventory will be disclosed in footnote disclosures. So that, that is clear? OK, so the breakdown of the inventory will be disclosed in footnote disclosures and also in also within footnote disclosures, we will have the first two footnotes which cover the policies, the accounting principles and policies re, uh, relating to all the elements of the financial statement. Now, in respect of inventories, in the first or second footnote, they will disclose to you the method of inventory valuation. How is inventory evaluated? Is it the lower of cost or market? Is it fair market value? What is the method of valuation? So when we talk of accounting principles and policies, we are talking of methods and criteria. Criteria for revenue recognition, criteria for inventory valuation, criteria for fair value, fair market valuations and all this stuff. OK, so every country has its own accounting principles and policies which tell you how to disclose financial information and how to report financial information. And behind the formation of these principles and policies are bodies. So who is responsible in the United States to formulate accounting policies and principles? It is the Securities Exchange Commission. The Securities Exchange Commission was established in 1934. And they are responsible for establishing accounting principles and policies. 
Now, Securities Exchange Commission was established in 1934. So there have been various bodies involved, which under the under the banner of SEC in helping formulate these principles. You know, we got Accounting Principles Board Opinion, Accounting Principles Board, Committee of Accounting Procedures. Okay. <clears throat> now, starting from 1973, only one body was officially accepted as the ultimate authority in setting up financial stand uh, accounting principles, and that is the Financial Accounting Standards Board. So if a statement or a principle is not authorized by the Financial Accounting Standards Board, a statute is not issued, then it is not an accounting principle. So as we speak today, <coughs> in the United States, all their accounting principles and policies are uh, set up by FASB. And, th and they have to be codified. Codified means every principle, revenue recreation, like, you know, they'll give you what section, what subsection, what is sub subsection of each principle of revenue recreations and all this stuff. And it has to be codified by FASP. So that is the background of uh, setting up the accounting principles. Uh, so that is FASB accounting codifications and all that stuff. Okay, then, you know, of course, there is a separate body which sets up uh, uh, principles for private company councils, you know, because they don't want to have so much extensive reporting. So there's a special. And setting up principles is an ongoing standard. And uh, it, it, there's an amalgamation with International Financial Standards Board and all this stuff. Now, whenever you're setting up uh, accounting principles and policies, you know, you have to have some framework. Now, framework means basically who are the users of the financial information? What is the objective of financial information? You know, so objective is, of course, to give information to people to make decisions whether to invest or not invest. Who are the users, external users and all the stuff, creditors, regulators, lenders, obligations. So every information should have certain characteristics. It should be relevant relevant from a decision point of view so that an investor can read that information you should be able to predict you should be able to confirm the values and they should be material it should be faithful so these are just you know some qualities of all these uh, principles that you have so i'm just going to that was a background on this uh, accounting principles i'm going to take you to you know something that has, covers uh, some numerics uh, numbers and we'll come up with now just before we get into that i just want to show you this one here <clears throat> Now, you know, when you look at your income statements <clears throat> or when you look at your financial statements, we have assets, liabilities. Assets are current assets, non-current assets. You know, something non-current which will generate benefit in the future. We've got liabilities, you know, obligations of the company. The difference between assets and liabilities is your shareholders' equity. That is the, that is the uh, you know, value to the shareholders. Distribution uh, to the owners is by dividend. Now, when you go to the income statement, you have revenues. Now, whenever you talk of revenues, you have to always remember that revenue is something that has to be matched with expenses. So for a particular period, uh, what is my revenue and what is my matching expenditures? So there are fundamental rules of or policies relating to revenue recognition. I mean, revenue recognition, you know, uh, the, your risk has to be passed. The title has to be passed. If you have an FOB contract, like, you know, freight on board contract, or you have a CIF contract, uh, you know, until the goods reach the uh, buyer, revenue does not transfer. Or if you have a completed contract method, that until the contract is completed, revenue will not be recognized. Or you have a percentage of completion method. So there are different rules of revenue recognition depending on different contracts that you have so that all will be discussed with you and then we have expenses so whatever is the revenue that is generated what are the matching expenditures so then we have gains and losses gains and losses are non-operating sources of income and expenditures of a company they are not they don't have any matching concept say i'll give you one example i'm a manufacturing organization and i have an old old building which i want to sell that building is not generating any revenue. So if I sell that building, I will report it as a gain. I'll not report it as a revenue from sale of a building. I'll report it as a gain. 
Similarly, if I lose some money on securities, I'll report it as a loss. So, and in your income statement, you have to present uh, gains, losses separately from revenue and expenditures. So now I'll take you to this uh, income statement presentation. Okay, after each lecture, you know, uh, like the financial accounting one is divided into eight modules. After each module like this, you know, accounting uh, concepts and uh, principles and standards and policies was one, one, uh, one module. After we go through all this, we will test you on some multiple choice questions in the class. You will ask questions, we'll clear all these doubts. Like the way I'm teaching you, I mean, right now I'm going fast because, you know, we, we're just doing this as a demo. <coughs> You would have read this full lecture at home. You would have listened to the lecture. I would explain this in absolute detail uh, when, when I'm delivering a four-hour lecture to you. So we'll test you with multiple choice questions. And then when you go home, you'll practice all the other uh, questions also. Okay, these are, you know, uh, what is cost? What is unexpired cost? You know, like inventory, expired cost is cost of goods sold. Uh, inventory goes on the balance sheet. Uh, all that stuff, revenue, expenses, gains, losses, what I discussed here, income from continuing operations. Okay. Now, in the United States, now we'll, we'll get into uh, get into income statement presentation. And this, you know, because it is uh, connected with numbers, so I thought, you know, we'll just, uh, for a demo class, we'll use this one here. Now, in the United States, as I mentioned to you, you have to break your income statement into revenues, expenditures, gains, and losses income from continuing operations okay and i'll explain you all this in a in a in a minute this is a trial balance of a company of december 31st year one so you know you know how we prepare statements you know you go, you get you have entries you make general entries you have uh, uh, ledger accounts and then you list on all your debit and credit balances and you come up with a trial balance so this is your trial balance so these trial balance will have your assets, your revenues, your expenditures, your gains. Uh, so from this trial balance, you will prepare your financial statements. You will prepare your uh, balance sheet as well as income statement. But before you do that, you will also prepare adjusting entries. So you have a trial balance. You, pre you prepare adjusting entries, which are... Uh, which are uh, you know, accruals or deferred revenue or prepaid expenses or, or things like that, which you'll have to book. <clears throat> and you have an adjusted trial balance. Now, from the trial balance, you will prepare uh, an income statement. Now, this is a multiple step income statement. <clears throat> so from my trial balance, I do all my adjustments. I have an adjusted trial balance. How does a typical standard income statement look under us cap so we got raiden industries income statement for the year ended december 31st year one so net sales now whenever we talk whenever we list sales we always list net sales now what, what do we what do we mean by net sales you know you sell something something might be returned there might be some discount given on the sales all that is subtracted from the gross sales and you list down net sales. And then, so you got, you know, net sales, including goods and services. You can list goods and services separately, rentals, less discounts and returns. Then you got cost of goods sold. Now, cost of goods sold is basically you got opening inventories. You add to that purchases, right, minus Cost of which okay, opening inventory plus purchases is uh, minus cost of goods sold is cost minus cost of goods manufactured is give, gives you cost of goods sold is equal to closing inventory. So you will calculate what is the cost of sales that that will go here for that particular period. Now what are you doing here? <clears throat> my cost of goods manufactured is hundred thousand dollars. But my cost of sales is only $800,000 because the remaining $200,000 is sitting as an asset, as inventories on my, on my balance sheet. So I will match my cost of sales 
my cost of sales with the sales of that period. That is a matching concept. So net sales minus cost of sales will give you the gross margin. So from the gross margin, you will minus selling expenses, uh, general administration, advertising is a selling expenditure, general administration and depreciation expense. Okay. Now, when you know when you come to <coughs> inventories, you know raw material, all that stuff, you'll take into account. So the total of all this. Now, all this is the operation, operating <laughs> section of the company. So this is called income from operations, normal operations. Then, as you see, we have gains listed separately, other revenues and gains, interest revenue, gain on sale of fixed assets. Why do we list them separately? Because they are not matching. We don't match these with any expenditures. These are non-operating. Other expenses, loss on sale of fixed assets. Okay, loss on this one here. Okay, now, so what do we have here now? We got revenues, expenditures, income from operations, gains, losses. Then we got, after all this, we calculate the income tax income tax expense and we have net income for the period now so this is this is how a multiple step income statement is presented now what happens is under us gap when a company decides to discontinue an operation like say i've got i've got four divisions i've got an electrical division i've got a manufacturing division i have a wholesale division the company decides to discontinue with the electrical division now us gap says that whenever you uh, whenever the management decides to discontinue a particular segment it should be reported separately so if you do not have any situation where a particular segment is going to be discontinued your income statement will end at net income but if the electrical division is going to be discontinued then you will not call it net income you will call it income from continuing operations income from continuing operations and below that you will give discontinued operations okay everything above income from continuing operations is presented gross of tax because income tax expenses shown separately. Gains and losses are presented on a net method. When I say net method, I'll give you one example. If I bought a fixed asset uh, for $10,000 and I sold it for $15,000, I'm not gonna show the cost as an, as an expense of 10,000 and I'm not gonna show 15,000 as revenue. So gains and losses will be netted off. So it'll be 15 minus 10, only 5,000 will be shown. Whereas if you go to revenues and expenditures, I sell 100,000, I will show 100,000. I spent 80,000 to sell it, I will show 80,000. But gains and losses are netted off. And then we show have, uh, you know, we have income tax expense as a separate item. Now, <coughs> so, so the choice is, <coughs> do I use net income or do I use continuing operations? I will use continuing operations if I have a situation where there's one division that is going to be discontinued. <clears throat> so now we'll go to, uh, it tells you what is selling expenditures, what is general administration, all that will be explained to you. I'm going to take you to discontinued open. This, this is about, uh, you know, US balance sheet. This whole next two modules are with revenue recognition methods.
Okay, as I mentioned to you uh, when we were doing income statement, now do I finish my income statement at net income or income from continuing operations? If you have discontinued operations, then you cannot use the terminology net income. You have to use income from continuing operations. Discontinued operations are reported separately from income from continuing operations, net of tax. Now, as I mentioned to you, everything above income from continuing operations was, was gross of tax. We had income tax expense separately. But when you report discontinued operations, you have to report it net of taxes. Now, discontinued operations is, uh, it is a decision by the management to discontinue a particular segment. The company should be, it should be a part of the entity. The company should be, uh, you know, it should be held for sale. You cannot just classify something as a discontinued operations and not sell it. And the accounting rule is, it, uh, so whenever you took look at discontinued operations, you have to present it separately from continuing operations. Discontinued operations is always net of taxes and it is comprised of three units. A, a discontinued operation will have gain or loss from operations, gain or loss from disposal and impairment loss. The total of all those three uh, will be presented net of taxes uh, below income from continuing operations and then your income statement will state income from continuing operations discontinued operations net of taxes and the total of both of them will be net income now discontinued operations does not only mean discontinuing a product line it could mean discontinuing uh, an area of business discontinuing a particular customer like you know if you if you sell to china and you don't want to sell to china that would be a discontinued operations if if it has it has to be and so there are various rules on discontinued you know results of operation gain and loss and disposal impairment loss how do you calculate that and then you know for after each topic that we discuss how do you present it in the balance sheet how do you disclose it in footnotes and uh, like the, and then here, like a trial balance, you know, it tells you that this particular company had so many operations. It took one and a half years to close. How will you show it uh, in your income statement in year one, year two, all that stuff. So this is uh, an example of a company and how you present all that stuff. So discontinued operations, uh, all that stuff. So if you see that you know income from continuing operations 4875 discontinued operations loss from operations net of taxes loss from impairment net of taxes the total of both this is equal to net income and then on the income statement you have to reflect earnings per share on discontinued operations separately on income from continuing operations separately on net income separately operations uh, income of operations separately also so that was, you know, uh, now you, all these things that are underlined, when you listen to the online lecture at home, which is by the Becker instructors, they will tell you and explain to you in detail and, and help you all that stuff. We will help you understand and explain these concepts so that your full understanding of this whole chapter is very, very strong. And then you supplement that by going home and practicing all the multiple choice questions and uh, the simulation questions and scoring 80 to 90 percent marks if you do that consistently for six seven months you should have no no problems passing the cp examination so uh, that i think that will finish the demo class uh, here today and uh, what i'd like to do now is to ask you any question on the CPA course, on the methodology, think that I can help you. Now, regarding uh, regarding how do you enroll, how what is the fees and all the stuff. Becker, in this uh, during this uh, virus situation, Becker has extended a very special promotional price for the CPA course. You will get a you will get a two year access two-year access, uh, online lectures, online books, hard copies,
simulations and everything else for only 95,000 rupees. Okay. Hacker has also come up with uh, come up with the option of you know unlimited access. I think I think that's 101 lakh 20 thousand rupees. The pricing of backer backer products throughout India are the same, uh, and you know there is no parallel there is no parallel material to backer in terms of you know making sure that you are best prepared for the CP examination. We as Orbit Institutes will help you make sure that you are fully aware of this course content. Uh, you have the best material at your hand. We will assist you with eligibilities. We will assist you with licensing. We will assist you with scheduling the examination. We will assist you with placements. We will assist you with on-hand training in U.S. taxation also. So with all those things, I'd like to uh, thank you for joining today. Now, if you have any questions, it will be my pleasure to help you out. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for your detailed session, Fish. My name is Mohit. Do you hear me? Yes, Mohit. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I am from Delhi, and uh, I have I had completed my I. So. Can you repeat it, please? I said I am from Delhi and I had completed my in 2006. And I have a, a nine year experience in the finance and account domain. And if I am talking about the eligibility, you already told in your session that the person is eligible i want to know the exact credit i will get and uh, what is the um, uh, structure for me uh, as well in terms of uh, pursuing this course okay so your starting uh, starting point would be that you send to us all your transcripts from uh, grade 10 grade 12 your graduation we don't we don't we do not need your experience because experience is only for licensing for writing the examination it is only your education so you submit all your copies you can email it to us scan your copies and send it to us we will look at it and we will tell you you are eligible but the final authority for granting you the eligibility is is a body appointed by the state board so what you will do is you will we will uh, tell you which application to fill out for an eligibility. You will send it to this uh, NASPA advisory services. Uh, there's a there's a small charge of I think two three hundred dollars with those certificates, and NASPA will confirm to you within three to four weeks that you meet the credit hours to write the CP examination. But we will help you and guide you all with that. So your starting point would be to send us all your certificates. And we will get back to you. Okay. So, okay. One more question. Uh, I also had a ITW degree, so I will get the more credit as compared to the bachelor degree. Yeah, you will get more credit. The more uh, the more courses you have done, if you've got BCom and you've got suppose after BCom you've got something else, you will get more credits. Yes. Okay. So, what is the credit of uh, BCom plus ITW? plus ICW, you know, uh, it varies from state to state, but one thing I can tell you is, with your BCom and ICW, you will be eligible to write the examination. Okay. A credit uh, that will be calculated at a later stage, right? See, what, what I'll tell you uh, with why why that question is not uh, is not uh, cannot be precisely answered now, because every state board you will apply to a particular state board. Every state board will give you different, there's little variations in credits given by different state boards. Hear me? Okay. So, okay, okay. If you look at your degrees, we'll tell you, okay, you apply to say uh, Montana or you apply to California and California will give you say 135 credit hours. You know, when, when we look at your certificates, we will know that you are eligible. 
okay okay and one more thing uh, i enrolled for the uh, bba canada program but the webinar is for the usc so you also conducting and helping to reach out uh, that program as well yeah unfortunately moy that program is only meant uh, you know we we have a uh, we have a seminar like this for uh, the canadian cpa but that is only meant for uh, qualified C- uh, cas in india okay only qualified cas because they have a uh, I'll, i'll tell you why because, because the body that we are associated with only provides the review course for the condensed examination not the full ca cp examination if you if you want to do cp in canada it is a four year exa- four year uh, course <coughs> indian cas have the privilege of a reciprocal arrangement they just have to write very condensed exam so our review course is meant only for indian cas qualified cas okay because they have a sign agreement mutual agreement on the exactly the exactly and mohit you know what happens is once you once you finish your us cpa then you'll be eligible for the canadian cpa directly or i need to go for some examination as well for that same examination that uh, uh, present cas will go okay 3 or 4 it is a formality the pass rate in that examination reciprocal examination is 95% almost everybody passes that exam because it is a very condensed exam okay okay so the way uh, to reach to the cp canada is that you need to first complete uh, cp a uh, us cp then you can go and uh, take that degree as well that is the shortest that is the shortest and the fastest way <clears throat> okay Okay. when you are when you are when you are qualified as a us cpa i will put you in touch with uh, devinder sharma uh, so many people who are st- who are uh, ca cpas from india and then got the canadian cpa exam in, uh, qualification through reciprocal so we will put you in touch with all that we know how to do it exactly but you know go step by step right now focus uh, focus in writing the cpa examination okay for everybody one uh, one note uh, the cp examination is not difficult it requires commitment it requires uh, responsibility and you know total concentration if you are serious within the next i think 7 8 months you can become a cpa it's a, it's a very easy it's much easier than a indian ca so you can easily do it try one question Uh, Sir, can I ask? I have a question. I am an Indian CA and uh, would like to enter the uh, Canadian CPA course. You are already an Indian CA. Yes, sir. Okay. What I suggest you do is, uh, you you write. Uh, all of you can write to us, and we will send you all the information on the Canadian CPA. Uh, CPA. Uh, you can write at info at orbitinstitutes dot com. even even people who are not uh, qualified cas right now and they are they are pursuing cpa if you want to join us for the canadian cpa seminar you are most welcome so that you can have some knowledge and even if you don't want to join now if you send us your email we will send you all the information on the canadian cpa uh, this is the canadian cpa seminar <coughs> Oh, Ram, when is it? When is it fixed up? In about a week, I think. In about a week. Okay, sir. Sunday, next Sunday. Okay, okay, sir. I have one question. Uh, earlier, like I was planning to do the Canadian CPA. So, as you said, said like there is some uh, MOU has been signed between the India ICI and the uh, Canada Canadian Institute. So, we need to appear for the, only for the CFE exam, the last exam. I think it's uh, CFE. Exactly. So, exactly. so, so, sir. In case if I go for the US CP and clear the US CP exam, so again this, this sir, uh, like as you said, there is a reciprocal agreement between some US and the Canada, and we can appear for the Canadian CP exam also. So, in that case exactly. also, we also we need to appear for the CFE exams, or exactly. some relaxation further, further relaxation relaxation is not there. In no, no, no. I Even do, okay. Whether you are an Indian CA or an American CPA. 
you still all of you will have to write that last exam okay okay sir thank you so much i would like to uh, i'd like to share couple of things with you uh, i'd like to share my uh, whatsapp number and uh, also my email id so if you have any questions uh, you can still write to me any time you can write to <coughs> you can write to info at orbitinstitutes.com okay so the email id is info at orbit institutes.com and my email id is chris my my name is christian sharma and uh, uh, shortened to chris k r i s dot sharma at orbit institutes.com and my indian my indian cell number and whatsapp number is 9 8 224-32699. My US cell number and my WhatsApp number. So I, I, I would I would request that you send me a message, and then it's easy to know who's uh, messaging, and I'll, I can we, then we can talk. So my Indian WhatsApp and cell number is 9822432699. My email ID is Chris dot Sharma at orbitinstitutes.com. My U.S. cell number and WhatsApp number is area code nine zero eight. It's a New Jersey number nine zero eight four two one three three seven one. Okay, what is the C? What is the fees for the CPA course? Now, a uh, couple of questions. You know, uh, is CPA helpful in India? I'm just going to quickly address that. as i mentioned to you <clears throat> cpa is a global qualification one third of the world's economy is us companies okay so wherever you have us companies you will require cpas india is the back office of a lot of cpa operations as i mentioned to you earlier also one of the top accounting firms 40% of their global tax returns and that runs into millions is done in india so there's a lot of demand for this qualification worldwide what is the fees for cpa the fees for cpa as i mentioned right now you can join the course because of the virus at a price of 95000 rupees the examination fees now if you come to the us to write the exam the the examination fees is about 1200 dollars in india it might be higher because if you can write it in dubai also and dubai it's higher also so i think in india and dubai it will be probably 2000 so in the united states it'll be about 1200 dollars so your total cost your total cost of writing the cp examination i can i can tell you very roughly and it's it's you know within a range of uh, 10% here or there 95000 for our course which gives you all the classes the material the eligibilities the free training in us taxation job placements everything and teachers and you know guidance and you know un unlimited access to all any one of us and then uh, the examination fees is about 1200 dollars which is again about a lakh of rupees so 1 lakh 2 lakhs so in a total cost of about 3 lakhs 3 lakhs uh, which is roughly about Three four thousand dollars of four four thousand five hundred, and then your stay in the U.S. Uh, in about four lakhs of rupees, you can probably write this whole CP examination. You know, whenever whenever I tell my students that whenever you're looking at a qualification like CPA or CFA or you know I or or all these top-notch qualifications, the cost is the least important factor. I, I gave you examples of people who got jobs sitting in India for ninety thousand dollars starting. Uh, somebody who rose from two lakhs to sixty lakhs within a period of four five years. Um, so many people coming back to this one. So there's no correlation. And then also you look at it, look at it from another angle. Just to do an MBA in India, even from a second rate uh, MBA institution, it costs you six to eight lakhs. Here within four lakhs. 
you can you can become a CPA, and you can become a CPA within seven to twelve months, and then open the doors to yourself to Canada and anywhere else in the world. Morning, sir. So, yeah, which country citizens are allowed to write the exam in India? I think in, uh, I, I personally uh, think it's all Indians and maybe people from Nepal. Sure. I, I don't know about that question, but I know people in India, Indian citizens can write the exam in India, whether people from other countries can come and write it. Just like you can go to Dubai to write the examination, probably I think people from Dubai can come and write it here. <laughs> I'm going to write. Yeah, yeah, please. Uh, I'm Annie. I'm from uh, Kerala. Uh, sir, uh, I'm, uh, I'm now preparing for CA IPCC exams. And I'm a uh, BCOM graduate. And uh, also, I'm doing a uh, Master of Commerce also. So, can I, uh, am I eligible for this exam? Yeah, you are a BCOM. You are eligible. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? So, let's just look at Okay, you are you are a group of people from Mauritius and want to wanted to do CPA. Yeah, you know we have students presently. As I mentioned to you, you know you can uh, join classes from anywhere in the world. We have. Uh, I was born in Nairobi, Kenya, by the way, and we have students from Kenya also. So people in Mauritius can join the course in India, get the Indian pricing and join our online classes. And they can come and write the examination in India also. Any more questions? You know, what I suggest you do is uh, anybody who is interested in uh, uh, any more questions, they can write to us. And if you want details on the Canadian CPA course, uh, you can also write to us. And for any question, any question, any time, you can always write to me or WhatsApp me. What do we do? Okay, just uh, maybe uh, we do training for CPA. We do training for Can uh, US CPA. We do training for uh, Canadian CPA. We do training for CFA. Uh, we do training for US CMA. We incorporate companies in the US. We provide accounting, bookkeeping, financial advisory, and tax services to Indian clients and U.S. clients worldwide. We do financial advisory. We do wealth management advisory. We do gift and estate tax advisory. And uh, if you need any kind of help, and we also help you with placements, we provide you free training in preparation of U.S. tax returns. So all, this, all these things are coupled here. You know, I was, um, uh, I moved from India to Canada back in 1980s. Then I moved to US in 2000. So I've lived in Canada. I'm a Canadian citizen. I'm a US citizen. I'm a US, I'm an OCI. So I have qualifications of all the three countries. I can help you uh, get the Canadian CPA qualification. I can help you get the US CPA qualification, I can help you with placements, I can advise you on what is the best 
route for you to take even if you want to stay in india we have connection with so many companies all that you have to do all that you have to do is to make up your mind you know we have a tendency to uh, defer defer taking a decision uh, you know i'll i'll study tomorrow i'll i'll do it next year and all the stuff it is something enhancing your careers you know i i kept on studying all my life you know as i mentioned to you i was born in nairobi kenya i did my high school in kenya then went to india studied in india came to canada i i got married after marriage i did my canadian ca then at the age of uh, 39 i did my cpa and then i did my ifrs in india uh, after studying my operations so uh, you guys are lucky you can do it immediately right now get all these qualifications and open open all the global doors to yourself so i would advise that you know whatever you want to do do take a decision and once you do take a decision you know i i can assure you that we'll guide you thoroughly in what is the best course of action for you okay this question uh, i i mentioned i did my cpa in uh, at the age of 39 and uh, somebody asked me whether it's it was uh, worth doing your cpa at that age okay let me tell you a couple of things uh, about uh, the the average age of our student in india average age the average age of a student in india is about 35 to 40 okay we have we have uh, right now uh, we had a we had uh, a person of about 58 years who joined the pune class we have people who uh, we have uh, had uh, a father and a daughter join the class in mumbai so people uh, okay and what happened to me uh, doing all this <clears throat> now i'll tell you uh, maybe you know i should go uh, you, you know somebody might uh, might ask me and uh, that why did i even do cpa did it, was there a need for me to do cpa and i'll tell you uh, what what prompted me from doing cpa <clears throat> as i mentioned i was born in nairobi i did my high school in kenya i came to india i did my bcom mbsca did not stay in india went back to africa so worked for two years went to canada worked as an auditor with the federal government provincial government wrote my canadian cp uh, cp examination cleared that worked as an auditor both with federal provincial governments and then in uh, 19 <coughs> 1996 uh, uh i have two twin boys i've got uh, you know my wife was expecting two twin boys i took time off from work my own practice i i left the government and i started my own commodity tax practice i left uh, i took time off from my practice because my wife was expecting twin boys and i was at home while i was sitting at home i decided to do cpa without even thinking whether i was going to use it or not use it and the only the only thought that crossed my mind when i decided to go and do cpa was that uh, i i had the experience i had the knowledge of accounting and auditing i i could do it uh, but did i need to do it from a from a money point of view no did i need to do it to enhance my education no then then why did i do it i was thinking and the only thing that prompted me to do cpa was because when you look at the education systems in canada versus us okay now canada has few universities you know if your kids want to become doctors or get into the medical profession uh, the the ratio of one one uh, selected student uh, applicant to a medical school versus the total number who apply the ratio is 1 to almost about 
whereas the ratio in the United States was 1 to 200 or 1 to 300. Okay. So the, the discrepancy in the availability of medical schools in Canada versus U.S. was way, way uh, different. So I decided that tomorrow if my kids grow up and they want to become doctors, maybe I should, they, they have a better chance of doing it in the U.S. So I did my CPA. And I did my CPA because I was home. I started my CPA course with Becker in January. In the second week of January, in the first week of May, I wrote my examination. I cleared all the four papers in four months. Okay, what has the CPA qualification done to me? <clears throat> the minute I passed my CPA examination, I there was a person who was coming from uh, Florida to teach me, to teach the Becker classes in Toronto. I used to go to the Becker classes. So I asked that person that, uh, how come you're flying every Saturday from Florida to Toronto to come and teach the CPA course? <coughs> he says, this is, a, this is an opportunity. Banker, Becker gives you franchises. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, he says, you, you, go, you fly for two hours, you come and teach the whole day, and then you fly the same day back. Or the, and it's, it's, like a, it's like as good as a second job. If, if you are uh, if you have good strength in the number I said that sounds good you know so I I was very well established I had my own practice but I applied for a Becker franchise in Canada or in the United States or in the United States and uh, but Becker uh, Becker said that they would uh, they could not give me in Canada or United States and they said let do you want to try India so number one, I did my CPA through default because my wife was expecting twin boys. I was studying during that time while I was taking care of them. And I cleared it in four months. Then I got the opportunity to open up franchise centers for CPA in India. Becker had already come to India. I'm just going to give you one example. Becker had already come to India before me. They had done a complete survey and they found that India had a good scope and there was a lot of potential to for uh, American companies doing operations and all that stuff. And they were looking for somebody. They did pro talk to a lot of people. They talked to uh, NIT, they talked to Aptech and all that stuff. Anyways, for somehow, I don't know how I got it, but they said, do you want to try India? I said, let me go and try. I mean, you know, uh, one thing I learned in my life is that, you know, rather than taking a decision whether you should do it or not should do it, at least give it a try. Give it a try. If it works, it works. If it doesn't work, you can always go back. Nothing is lost. So I came to India. I came to Delhi. I set up my first office in GK1 Delhi. I'm just going to give you a, a brief background so as to how, how the CPA operations took off in India. I, started, I opened my first office in uh, GK1 in Delhi. And I had my first batch, first batch of 48 students in Delhi. I came in April. End of April, I started my first course on first week of June. I had 48 students. That time, that time, back in 1997, the fees was $2,200. Today, it is 95,000 rupees, much less. Okay, I had 48 students. And 48 students meant $96,000. And I was teaching, I was enrolling students, I was marketing, I had a couple of instructors which I trained. Then I went to Bombay. After six months, I went to Bombay. How did I open a center in Bombay? I did not know anybody in Bombay. I went to an STD shop. I'm just going to give you these small stories. I went to an STD shop and I told that guy, I said, listen, I want to use your telephone lines if I, i'm going to place an ad in the paper saying that there's a seminar on cpa and i'd like to you know people to call into your numbers and you could just have to register them and tell them take their name down take their number down take their email down and tell them that on such and such date there's a seminar for us cpa in uh, in the in bombay in a hotel and uh, 
so and i'll pay you 10 rupees per per every entry that you have so i advertised and there were 500 people who inquired for that seminar 500 people so i paid that std guy 5000 rupees but i had 500 people who were interested in that seminar so i started the bombay batch after 6 months with 50 students 50 students no teacher i didn't have any teacher at all nobody there were there were hardly any cpas in india at that time there was no cpa at all so i trained this lady uh, i was mentioning jaisi sunkara she was a she was a student with kpmg so she enrolled for the cpa examination i'm just sharing this secret with you so i told her that you be a student and as well as, uh, as well as a teacher so one day before she taught i would teach her the class from delhi and then next day she would uh, deliver the class in uh, in bombay that it kept on going on i opened up centers in chennai bangalore hyderabad cochin jaipur we we, we did training for janpack for wns accenture american express goldman sachs jp morgan deloitte kpmg eny all these companies so 12 cities hundreds of companies now what did this cpa do for me <coughs> this cpa opened up doors for corporate training for me i have conducted trainings for a thousand companies in india i have conducted training in conjunction with the indo american chamber of commerce on us accounting standards on us cap on auditing standards registering on nasdaq complying with securities exchange commission socks compliance uh, all this training the training part of uh, because of my cpa gave me a lot of income i would go and do a seminar for two days i would make 5 lakhs 6 lakhs of rupees in 7 lakhs of rupees in two days and i associated i established a network of 120 cpa teachers we used to go together i've done training for uh, reliance for their petroleum company in uh, surat i mean name it i've got, i've done so much training programs i converted i converted the financial statements of satyam in hyderabad uh, from uh, uh, ifrs to us cap from indian cs to us cap so all these assignments came my way because of my cpa designation i got acknowledged by deloitte i can send you pictures of you know i've got if you go to the pune office you'll see so many deloitte posters and all that stuff i for 11 years in a row i've conducted training for employee fresh graduates of employees on us taxation on basic us accounting principles and all that stuff i opened up cpa firms because of my cpa i have a back i have a back office in uh, in pune today i get calls from all over the place people asking on opening companies in us on um, estate and gift tax planning there are so many indians here who have got properties in india uh, in india and they they ask you how do you manage your wealth how do you do wealth management gift and estate tax so education will never go waste it will always stay with you and age is not a factor you know even even 10 years of prime growth in your life can make wonders to yourself and you know always remember that when you do when you do qualifications like cpa at whatever age you want you are you are doing it for yourself for sure but it is also benefiting your children your children will be able to settle anywhere in the world because you will be able to settle you will have opportunities everywhere so this education will never go abroad okay what what kind of courses should you should you pursue courses that are globally accepted courses that are recognized and will give you employment anywhere in any part of the world canada will hire cpas singapore will hire cpas dubai will hire cpas uh, malaysia us all all india will hire cpas 30% of our students stay back in india because they get job opportunities in india at much much better salaries 
so age is not a factor and uh, so I, I would not even um, think about think along those lines any questions hello I'm going to write something for all of you. Okay, after, after one of the questions is that after doing my CPA, can I come to United States to work and can I get an H1 visa and can I come to Canada? Let me tell you one thing about uh, the difference between the immigration process in Canada versus US. Once you become a CPA in Canada, you will, you will directly get uh, if you get a job in uh, Canada, you will directly get a, work, uh, a residence status in Canada. And you live in Canada for a couple of years, you can become a citizen. In the US, getting a job as a CPA is not an issue at all. <clears throat> lot of CPA, lot of, uh, there are so many CPA firms. And the turnover of uh, fresh entries into accounting firms is so high. 20 to 25 percent of the staff of accounting firm changes very very quickly very very quickly so they are always looking to hire people in fact everybody everybody's asking us can you get people from india to do audits for us can you help us uh, do tax returns and all that stuff we are associated with companies like shore prep um, out of mumbai they they train people in U.S. taxation just like U.S. India tax would do, and they place people on temporary basis in uh, United States uh, during the tax season. So there are so many opportunities. I mean, you 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 will you will not uh, you not have a problem. Achha. Now in the U.S., your immigration process goes like this. Uh, uh, in the U.S., your immigration process goes like this. you come, you get an H-1 visa, you work for an employer. Your employer converts your H-1 visa to a green card. Okay, name of uh, name of the company you mentioned. Shore Prep in Mumbai. He's a very good friend of mine, uh, uh, and uh, you know we will help you get jobs in India and everywhere else. Which company, what is the name of the institute? Which institute are you talking of?
we'll be uh, holding seminars like this every um, every two weeks and uh, you know you can join but you know you have my email id you have my cell number i'm connected with you now so you can call me uh, you can message me anytime and you can write to me anytime and whether you join or you don't join that is your decision but i am always available to help you out in anything that you need help on regarding these uh, regarding your career So shall we uh, wind up now or you have any questions? Hello?